Paul Jarova called you. You're welcome indeed to another edition of the programme. Can I remind you as usual that we'll be handing over to Martin Logan in Manchester who has some more great stories featuring the Irish community right across the UK. But this week we have a remarkable story of an American couple who sold their very, very successful company in America to move to Newport to set up a cottage industry. Hello, Brittany. How are you? I'm good. Good. Come on in. Brittany, how did you and your husband uh, come to make Ireland your home? Uh, well, it's a funny story. We started coming to Ireland, well, originally came to Ireland because I have family in Dublin and I wanted Harry to meet my aunt. So we came over in 2009, uh, visited with the family, and then we threw a fly rod in our bag just because we'd heard there might be fishing here. So we proceeded to tour Ireland and had a fly rod, did some fishing, and discovered the fishing here. It was phenomenal for trout. And it wasn't really until we were fishing um, on Beltra, actually, with a friend, and he said, um, geez, you and Harry should buy something here. You could leave all your gear, you can just come over when you want, when the fishing's good. And uh, I said, you know, we're thinking about that. And he said, really? And we kept fishing. 30 minutes goes by. <laughs> And he says, what kind of house would you buy? And I said, oh, I don't know, something cool, some, something with a story to it, historic story to it. And uh, we could keep fishing. 30 minutes goes by and he says, I know just the place. And I, Harry and I looked at each other and he was on the phone. He calls, calls the owner of the house and said, are you thinking of selling your house? And uh, still thinking of selling your house. And he said, well, I'm retiring next year. Yes, we are. And he said, I, I'm with a lovely American couple. Would you mind if we stopped by? And this poor fellow, he's like, sure. <laughs> but we kept in touch and uh, he was gonna retire and he did, uh, they did sell us their house and we never looked back. Did you have a plan when you were decided to move over here then, and particularly to Newport and Country? Um, our plan was really simple. We were gonna move over here, um, relax, farm, learn how to farm <laughs> and uh, fish. So, which brings us to the business you've set up here now in Newport and County Mayo, the Sheepish Dog. Right. So what's, what's that all about? Well, what happened was really simple. Um, the sheep came with the house. The owner asked us, would you like to keep the sheep? And uh, we said, mm, sure, you know. Thought they were pretty cool. They looked very nice. I knew nothing about sheep farming, but figured it'd be interesting to learn. So um, we kept the sheep. And in the first season when we sheared the sheep, I had this massive mound of gorgeous Suffolk wool. And I just kept looking at it, and every time I walked past it, I'd look at it, and I'm like, you know, this would be a great fiber to stick into a dog bed. And we had a company in the U.S., it was kind of a, a hobby company on the side, um, that made dog beds in the U.S. And it did very well, and it was uh, geared towards the outdoorsman, uh, so that was in the nature of our ad agency. Um, but, and I'd always wanted to fill them with wool, but um, you couldn't... Source. You couldn't source the wool very easily. So I, when I saw this mound of wool, I was like, oh, this would be... So I tried to figure out how I could actually source the wool here to put in that company's beds. And then I started to think about it, and I thought, geez, the, the blanket wool, I've always thought the Irish blanket wool here was beautiful. And uh, it was always something that people collected when they visited. You know, they were very attracted to the wool blankets. And, uh, and our friends would visit, and they'd, you know, hats and suits and jackets. And I mean, it was very appealing uh, fabric. So I thought, well, actually, we could go one step better and make outer covers that were Irish wool, fill them with Irish wool, and sell them to an outside market, uh, Irish, UK, American. We'd start with Americans because we knew that market. And it's huge, it's about $62 billion a year. Yeah, and uh, the last numbers then in the census was uh, about $62.5 billion. In contrast, um, in the pet market, and in contrast, Ireland's only $14 million. So that's a huge difference. And obviously Ireland is only one of, I mean, it's, I have to keep reminding myself, it's the size of Wisconsin, it's not the US, but at the same time, the market in the US is huge. And uh, pet beds is also, the, peop, the American market is, they just really love their pets and they treat them very well. So how did you go about then setting up this company? Well, what, what I started doing was scouring the wool in my kitchen just to see, you know, if I could figure out how to clean the lanolin out, which was, in and of itself was a big learning curve. Once I realized how we could do that, I said to Harry, well, 
the best way to set up a dog bed business would be to sew them ourselves instead of being reliant on a manufacturer. So if we're going to do it, we would have to invest in machines and, and see if there's sewers. I didn't even know if there would be sewers in the area. And uh, we ran an ad in the Mayo Advertiser. And it was very funny because I was a I, we'd sorted all this out and I knew that if there were no sewers, we didn't have a business. So we ran the ad in the paper and we put off going to check the P.O. box because I was afraid there'd be nothing or one or two. And so Harry's like, come on, we're going to the post box. We're going to see who's out there. So we went in. I stayed in the car. He went in. He came out. He had nothing in his, nothing in his hand behind his back. He stat. He got in the car and he goes, I think we're in the sewing business. And we, I couldn't believe it. The, um, the number of people here that were between either hobby level, quilters, uh, dressmakers, industrial sewing pasts. They worked in the past for other manufacturers. Um, but the, the pool of people available made it a very viable business. And that was, we were delighted. Now, where did you source the uh, material then from the bed? Um, actually doing a lot of research in Ireland. I wanted, to do, I wanted to work with a smaller family mill as opposed to a giant conglomerate. I wanted to make sure it was still Irish wool. And, uh, and I found a, uh, there's a mill in Tipperary. They make beautiful blankets. And uh, I contacted him. I think he thought I was a little, you're going to what? <laughs> but he humored us. And uh, we went to see him. And I bought a bunch of his remnant uh, leftover bolts from maybe a run they'd done for somebody. So we bought some of that so that we you know, could sew up some beds and see how it was going. And I bought a bunch of blankets, really. I, initially, we started the company sewing from the blanket wool because I wanted to sew them and see what worked, what didn't work, before we actually invested in earnest in rolled goods. So we, we got a bunch of blanket wool, and the beds are fabulous. We tested them. We had various types of dogs sitting on them, making sure that, you know, and actually the, my, one of my favorite beds is a very woolly bed, and uh, I personally sewed up a kind of oblong, funny-looking dog bed and put it on the ground in front of our aga, and our dog got on it. She loved that bed so much that I was like, that's definitely one of the dog beds, yeah. So you make uh, different types of dog beds. We do, yeah. Um, what I've learned from our other business was that uh, there's two types of dogs sleeping patterns. Uh, big dogs like to lay on their side flat out. They usually hang their head over the side, so they like a big cushion, really not unlike a couch cushion. And uh, it has to be filled pretty full. Ours are filled five, six inches um, for their weight. And then uh, the smaller dogs like the security of a sidewall, so we make a bed that's got a kind of a s enclosure for them to get in and, and lean into. What stage is the business at now? Are you, you're, you're manufacturing the beds and you're exporting them mainly? Well, we basically spent the winter months building inventory on the outer covers and building inventory of the inserts that we would fill with wool. And then we spent the winter months sorting the wool that we purchased, um, the raw wool, to be scoured and cleaned. And so we now have enough inventory that we are essentially just at the beginning stages of starting to export. Most of our sales will come from the U.S. initially. And we're literally, uh, we launched the company at the beginning of J June, and officially, and uh, we'll start shipping. The website went live mm, two weeks ago. And uh, so, I mean, we're right at the beginning of reaching out to that customer. So that'll take a little bit. We need to do some, you know, kind of announcements that we're here. Yeah, for sure. Are you confident enough that the business will succeed in that? Um, well, a big important part of the leading up to the opening was testing the product. Um, we signed up a bunch of field staff, we call them field staff, but potential customers that we knew that would give us honest feedback. So, and we started kind of putting product out there to see what the feedback was, because I wanted to make sure that there was, you know, this was a viable scenario. So the feedback was excellent and everybody, that anyone that we interacted with was delighted, beyond delighted. So. We, knew we, have, we know we have a business, and from my experience in the company in the U.S., I know it's a viable business. So I think it's just a matter of getting the word out there. Uh, what's going to be the next stage now of the uh, development of the business? Well, the company was initially organized as a small business. Um, you know, we have a small team of sewers. We have a small team of people helping me scour the wool. The, the way we scour the wool is a small batch. 
very small batch. And I did that because I didn't want to make an investment in all of this equipment if I wasn't sure that it was actually going to work. So we're working really hard to keep up with the production that we have to produce, but the next step would be to then graduate to a facility in which we can outfit it in proper washing machinery, scouring machinery, drying machinery, spinning machinery. Um, right now it's me and it, it, there's actually a machine where you put the wool in and it spins the water out. So all of those machines obviously have costs, so we would, the next step would be to plan out and, and manufacture a facility. One of the things that I think is really wonderful about Ireland is that when people visit, they're very into the culture. They, they come for the culture. And part of that is sheep and wool. And I think it would be very, very fun to have an open facility where people... 40 you you're very welcome back to the program. We're here at the farm where they process the wool that goes into the dog beds. So this is where the wool comes when we actually collect it from the farmers, and it's really important. We've collected all of our wool from Newport, or in the Mayo, very north Mayo, er, or south Mayo area. Um, over 81 farmers in the area have contributed to our startup, and uh, we bring the wool here in bags, and the first step is what Connor's doing here, and he's going through a fleece, and he's basically pulling off the unusable part of a fleece. About 20% of a fleece is not usable. So after we've sorted the wool, we bring it into this shed, which is the processing shed. And the first thing we do is it comes over to a table and we prep it for scouring. So we go through this wool, it makes it into a bin here, and that's what it looks like. It's nice and clean. It's just greasy. There's no real dirt. It goes into the bins. These get filled with water. Super high temperature is what makes the lanolin fall out. We fill the bin with the wool, a biodegradable soap, rinse, rinse again, to get all the soap out. And then it goes onto these racks here, which are our drying racks. So we can pop the wool in here. It sits on the rack. It takes about 24 to 48 hours to dry, air dry. We want it to, to naturally dry. Then after it's dried, we bring it over to here. And we run it through what's called a picking machine. And this machine fires up. So now that it's gone through the machine, we come around to the other side and in the hopper, it comes out and it's sorted from here into a bin. And this is where we collect the clean, that's all been, that's all been through that machine and it's nice, white, fluffy, wonderful fiber that goes into the beds. So Brittany, the, the farm now, you, you're talking about the farm. How, how big is it? Uh, the farm's 62 acres, and uh, the pr two owners pr prior to us made a magnificent facility. It's a big, giant barn. Um, it's capable of, there's 16 acres of bog, and there it's capable of, it's comfortable with 100 to 200 sheep, I would say. We have just uh, 68 ewes, and then we have a, just had a flock of 35 lambs. So um, I don't necessarily, I don't intend to fill it to its maximum capacity because it's a lot of time. But um, it's a beautiful farm, and it has all the facilities that make the storage, the farming, the lambing, the sheds. It's, it's very well organized and designed. And would it be difficult then to use that area as a kind of a manufacturing place for your, your sheepest dog company? Uh, we are initially. I don't intend to long term because I don't... Um, <laughs> I have a funny little weird belief about mixing business with my home life. I like to be able to separate, but right now the farm is kind of our business. <laughs> so um, 
we're look, that's why we're looking at building a facility that would be off the farm. Um, the sheep will always be there and I'll always be there and the wool, but, and I'll keep the small facility that I have to do mostly experimental product development, but um, we would like to build a facility that's geared towards the manufacturing that we want to do. And why do you scour the wool then? Uh, it's a very interesting process. The scouring, um, we shear the wool and we buy the wool from farmers once a year. It's kind of a, a little nerve-wracking because you have to kind of estimate how much wool you'll need. So you go into it going, eh, yeah, I'm not really sure. But um, uh, the wool comes in a full fleece. Obviously there's parts of the fleece that you can't use and you do what's called skirt the fleece and you basically pull off the chafe around the neck and the unusable parts of the wool. And uh, we put that, actually have a giant compost. We compost the wool. Um, so that goes to the scrap table and then what's left is the good quality fleece. We grade that fleece and we grade it by the breed, the, the quality of the wool itself. Um, some wool will have very heavy lanolin, some won't, depending on the breed. And we, so we, we, we uh, separate the wool by the type and quality into bags to be scoured and the bags are all marked and uh, then we take those bags and we ha have to go through yet again to prep it for scouring. So you have to kind of open it up and and any little weird things. The best, best case scenario is you can get as much of the veg matter or any of that stuff out of it before you scour it. So, and then it goes from the scouring, to be scoured table to the bins that we have set up. And it's a six bin process. And it's all timed and we have a water temperature controlled on demand water source that fills the bins at 160 degrees, which is the critical temperature for that lanolin just to fall out. If you have it at the right temp, it'll fall right out. It's an amazing thing to watch because you can see it just float to the surface. And uh, so we get the lanolin in the hot, hot water, it falls out. We push, push it into a rinse of the same hot water. And so if there's any residue lanolin, it would come out in that second rinse. And then we rinse it yet again. And then we drain it and we put it on natural drying racks. So the wool sits on a drying rack for probably 48 hours. It's a slow drying process. We have fans, but you want it to dry naturally so that it will return to its crimp that it has naturally. Uh, depending on the breed, some crimp is really kinky looking and others is really fuzzy. It's hard to explain. Suffolk, my preference is Suffolk because it dries really fast. It's, um, it doesn't seem to absorb water like Texel. Texel is very soft, very white, gorgeous fleece, but the Suffolk is very quick to process because it dries quick. Yeah, there's a lot of work in the process. There is. There is a bit of work. Um, the way we're doing it right now is kind of like a home spinner would do. It's a, a very cottage industry, um, mostly because we wanted to perfect the process so that we knew when we went build a facility what we actually needed specifically, not guessing. So the, this has enabled us to really experiment with the best way to process the quickest, most efficient way. I know that what we're doing now to create the fleece at the end, so once it's dry, it goes through the picker. Um, I know that what we're doing is way slower than it should be. So I have priced the beds to where it needs to be so that what, where, well, where that will improve is just our profit margin. So right now, they're not the most profitable products I'll ever make, but I know that they, that, will, that will come with the machinery that we invest in. So. And finally, uh, Brittany, people, you, you can ship this product mm -hmm. fairly reasonably to clients all over the world. I was actually pleasantly surprised um, when we had our company in the States, Wisconsin to Boston, would be about $40 to ship. And uh, from Ireland, I was pleasantly surprised to learn that through the post, I can ship from Newport to Chicago for 20 euro and four days. And that's to me, I mean, a no brainer, really easy. It means that someone can come into the shop, they can see a bed, they might be on their bicycle, they're not gonna put it in their backpack. We can ship this to you. It'll be waiting for you when you get home. And they get home and they have a little piece of their trip waiting for them. And all Irish made. All Irish made. 100%. 100%. Harry, your job is to these wonderful beds to get them out there on the market. So what's your strategy? Well, there are really three parts to marketing the dog beds. The first is our website, which Brittany did create it because she had a background of 30 years of making websites. And uh, <clears throat> it shows how the, how the beds are made it shows uh, beautiful photographs of all the different beds and then gives you an opportunity to buy one, which is obviously what we, what we hope will happen. Uh, and it's the, the website's name is thesheepishdog.com. If you Google sheepish dog, it'll come up. The second component is um, 
public relations, and we've developed uh, uh, proprietary databases of the editors <clears throat> for all the major pet publications in Europe and North America, um, all of the outdoor-oriented magazines, in the magazines and, and publications in, uh, uh, in North America and, and mostly in the UK and Ireland. Um, and then uh, a lot of Irish publications in the in the United States because we think there's going to be a huge interest in uh, the Irish Americans uh, for having genuine Irish dog bed stuffed with Irish fleece uh, in their in their house in uh, Boston or, or Chicago or, or Philadelphia. The third component will be uh, image advertising, and we'll go to the uh, the key magazines that have reasonably affluent viewers who own pets. And, and run um, color ads that, that will, with the idea of draw, driving those people to come and visit the website and hopefully buy a bed. So it's pretty straightforward. Coming from an advertising background, does, does that make it easier for you? I don't think we'd be able to do it if we didn't have an advertising background because if nothing else, just, just knowing where to, wh who the communications uh, channels are is something that comes from years of experience. And we have friends in the U.S. with a lot of the magazines that are going to help us out. So, Is it difficult to get out to the market from a rural part of Ireland here in, in, in Mayo and in just outside Newport? It, before the Internet, it would be impossible. But now it, it's doesn't, you, could be, you could be in, a, in rural Mayo or downtown Manhattan in New York City, and it doesn't really make any difference. Actually, I think being in rural Mayo is, is an advantage. <laughs> it's a better address. <laughs> yeah. And um, so people come onto this website now and they can see the different beds. And then the next process then, you take the order and it's shipped out. Yes, it ships out via post and um, uh, it's tr traceable. And for American customers, we've established a, uh, um, a receiving warehouse in the U.S. if they need to return. return. Is, is the website live now? Is it gone yes, live? Yes, there it is. Yeah. And have you had much response to it yet, or is it just to you? Um, a very little bit, but on purpose, because we've been running test orders to make sure that the, uh, that the delivery is smooth and, um, and so that we work out any, any bugs before we really, we really uh, roll out a, a public relations campaign, which will be the next big step. And that'll take place in the next week, probably a week or two. And are you confident that uh, you'll get to the markets, to the people that you want to as well? I, I think that, um, I think we will for the simple reason that people who own pets are very passionate about them and, uh, and, and, they, uh, and, they, and they like spoiling them. And so this is the ultimate way to spoil your dog. <laughs> What is going to be, Harry, your biggest selling point on, 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 on this whole market strategy? 100% Irish made from Irish materials with sheep sourced in Ireland and, uh, and nothing imported from China and none of, the, uh, none of the, uh, the tomfoolery that people do with bringing in Chinese goods and sewing labels on them and pretending otherwise. This is the real McCoy. And you're going to open a retail outlet, look. We are, yeah. We're hoping to secure a space, and uh, we'll have a. It'll be. Um, it'll be just. It'll be our beds, but it'll also be wool products, so uh, blankets, pillows, the beds, and uh, uh, all made here in Newport. I'm funny about how I want everything to be truly a Newport product, so that's why we're sitting in Newport. <laughs> Well, Britain, we wish you well. It's a, it's a great concept, and I've no doubt it's going to be a huge success for you and, and your husband, Harry. You took a big risk coming to Ireland, but it's, it's, I think you'd agree it has paid off for you. I think we would have come to Ireland regardless, um, but I think that having something to do while we're here and bringing a few jobs is a good thing. Well, well done. Congratulations. <laughs> What a fantastic story and well done to Brittany and Harry and we wish them continued success. It's a wonderful story of a couple who came here to Ireland, to Newport, set up a business, 100% Irish, from the farm here right through to the finished product, the Sheepish Dog Bed. And you can find out more about their products by visiting www.thesheepishdog.com. Well, that's where we have to leave it for this week. Thank you for your company. Do join us again next week at the same time. So once then, Slong of Fall.